Hey guys, thanks for having me. Thanks to Karma Sue for having me speak today. My name is Jess Green. I'm the owner of Pet Wants Denver. Been doing this for about three years. Um, I'll go into what Pet Wants is a little bit later, but today I'm going to be presenting what's in my pet's bowl. So basically just a pet nutrition 101 so you can understand exactly what you're feeding your fur baby. So pet food has been around for a really long time. It's come a long way. Um, pet food originally started from basically scraps or garbage that they wanted to make a profit of, so they started selling it to pet food industries. Um, like I said, it's come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Just like with, with human health, um, there's always changes and updates, so we were using um, our current knowledge to make pet food, um, but we didn't see how it was affecting the pets until a big surge of them died. Um, and so it traced back to things like wheat gluten and rice protein that were imported from China. So that's why a lot of times you hear people say nothing from China and we're, we're wary of ingredients from there because of the quality and um, the long-term effects on, on dogs and cats. So like I said, we've made a lot of strides to improve our, our pet nutrition, but we still have a long way to go. Um, AFCO is basically like FDA for pet food, but when people say that they follow a a AFCO guidelines, um, it really just means that in a span of six to eight months, they have not had any negative effects on a pet. Um, so you know that's not a, a really long time to know if there are negative side effects. So AFCO, I like to say, is the very bottom baseline that you need to meet for, for pet nutrition requirements. All right, so what we can do, Educate, educate, educate. That's what I do. That's my passion, um, to educate exactly what you're putting in your pet's bowl. Um, my three questions that I follow are where, when, and how. So you can ask questions like, where is this food sourced? Where is this food made? A lot of times that's really hard to find out from a pet food store, from a pet rep. They're not going to necessarily know those answers. And to get in touch with the manufacturers in this day and age is, is basically impossible. Um, so that's where, when. When were the ingredients sourced? Um, oftentimes, mass production companies just have their ingredients sitting around for months or years at a time. For example, last year, um, we ran out of lamb. We couldn't produce our lamb anymore because um, there was a global shortage of lamb. Um, however, these mass production companies had lamb just sitting there. Um, so the global shortage didn't really affect them. So it's things like that that you want to start thinking about. So when were they sourced and then when was the food made? Um, on the back of your packages of your food, you'll see a date. Um, that's the best buy date. But so it could be, you know, one to two years old by the time that you buy it. It could be close to expiring by the time that you feed it. So those are the kind of questions. And then how, that's probably the most important. How was your food made? What temperatures were it, was it? was the food cooked at, um, you know, what size quantities was it made at, made at, um, and things like that. So, so the baseline is mass production companies make huge quantities at a time. They cook them at temperatures sometimes of 400 degrees plus because they want to turn a profit quickly. So they want to make the food in and out. Um, but if you're into cooking at all, you know that if you blast food at that high of temperatures, you're blasting out all the nutrients from the start. So, and then it sits on the shelf for one to two years. So by the time that you feed the food, um, it's been blasted and it's pretty old. So those nutrients, your vitamins, your minerals, your fat content has really decreased in value. Um, so where, when, and how. That's my, my goal for everyone is to start asking qu those questions. Take it back to the basics, dogs and cats are carnivores. They're used to eating meat. Um, we have vegetarians and vegans in, in, in human world. However, dogs and cats, they need their meat. Um, they can be categorized into obligate and facilitative. Obligate, think obligation. So cats are obligate carnivores. They have an obligation to eat meat, predominantly meat diets. That is what they need in their systems. Facilitative can also be called opportunistic, so think opportunity. Dogs are facilitative carnivores. They eat what's available to them, focusing on meat. But they can take things in like grains and vegetables and those kind of foods with a focus on the meat. Um, like I said, humans are omnivores, vegans, vegetarians, whatnot, but dogs and cats need their meat. The most important part is this third part. We live in a carb-filled world. 
I love my carbs. Um, however, they are very cheap and readily available. So a lot of these big companies trying to turn a profit will use these filler items like corn gluten meal, wheat gluten, gluten, all these really cheap carbs um, that will actually um, register as a protein um, and bulk up the fiber content so it looks really good, but it's actually very cheap. And going back to the, the carnivore point, they need their meat. That protein should be coming from meat and not carbs. What has changed, if you think about dogs and cats in the wild years and years ago, they had to work for their food, right? They had to hunt and they had to kill. Um, so that took time, that took energy, but nowadays we have our beautiful pets that we love so much, but we just give them their food. They don't have to work for it. Um, and so they don't need as much as they once did. However, a lot of times we leave them at home while we go to work and we feel guilty, which leads to more treats. Um, so there's a high, high, high percentage of obese cats and dogs in our lives now just because of they are, they are not working for their food. Um, Low-quality low foods lead to weight gain, dull skin and coat, allergies, and other health issues. Um, it's easy to scoop and forget. So, yep, yeah, that's, that's the point. It's easy to scoop and forget and not think about what you're putting into your pet's goal. So my goal here is to help you be more mindful about exactly what you're putting in your pet's bowl. So next we're going to talk about ingredients. Just like you do when you go to the store, you might look at the back of a food to see the ingredient deck. Um, a lot of times people don't think to do that on their pet food because everything's on the front of the bag. It says, ah, oh, meat first, you know, no corn, wheat, or soy, no artificial preservatives. So we forget to look at the actual ingredients. And this is what's going to tell us exactly what's in that food. Um, so on the left, we have some good ingredients. All of our meats, turkey, chicken, beef, salmon, or those um, those meat meals, identified meat meals, and I'll talk about what a meat meal is in a minute. Um, you want to see things like pea or pea fiber, whole grains like rice or brown rice, those are your gluten-free grains, um, all your vitamins and minerals, oatmeal, pumpkin, pre and probiotics, fruits and vegetables, all wonderful ingredients. Most important part is to the right, less than ideal. Corn, wheat, and soy are three of the most common allergens for dogs and cats today, but they're also three of the cheapest fillers that um, can turn a large profit for these mass production companies. Um, corn, wheat, and soy will register as protein. So when you look at that guaranteed analysis on the back of a um, pet food bag, and you see you know, 35% protein, you have to ask yourself, where is that protein coming from? Is it coming from good meats, or is it coming from things like corn, wheat, and soy? And a lot of times we're over here. Um, animal fat. Fat is great. Dogs and cats run off of fat just like we do carbs for our energy. However, animal fat, what animal is that? Is that a frog? Is that a dog? Is that a, a cow? We don't know. Um, so it's a little unsettling when they don't identify the source. Poultry meal and fat, again, same thing. What kind of poultry? Is that a chicken? Is that a duck? A turkey? Why are they not telling us? A lot of times, unidentified ingredients are so that they can use what's cheapest on the market at the time. They're not held accountable to what they use, um, and then they can get away with it because they're not identifying it. Byproducts, um, if you don't know what a byproduct is, it's anything left over. So it's beaks, carcass, feathers, feet, anything left over. Basically what happens is they take all the meat and bone meal out, everything else falls to the floor, they squidgy it up, they spray it with these chemical preservatives, they have to, and then they sell it off. Um, so already, if you see the word byproduct on the back of your bag, you know that it's been sprayed with chemical um, carcinogenic preservatives. Um, even if it doesn't say that on the bag, by law, they have to. And you know it's not your meat and bone meal, your, your, um, sorry, your bone and organ meat. Um, lower grades of meat, we have McDonald's up to steakhouse. Same thing with pet food industry. Color additives, um, as you might know, animals can't see colors like we can. So those red, green, and yellow bits that you see in some of the, the foods, we're like, oh, we want colorful meals. So do, our, so do our dogs and cats. Well, A, they can't see it, and B, do you think they care what the color their food is? Definitely not. Um, so that's more of a marketing perspective. Brilliant, but um, non-beneficial. Animal digest. That's just a little gross, um, but again, unidentified. 
Um, unnecessary ingredients and fillers, that goes back to the corn, wheat, and soy, bumping up that fiber and protein content, but a filler. Um, so they don't have any advantageous goals for the animal. Meat and bone meal, again, just unidentified. What animal is that? That could literally be a bottom dweller of the sea. That could be a rabbit, a frog, a dog. We don't, we have no idea. And again, it's really hard to get in touch with the manufacturing to ask those questions. And they're probably not going to tell you because it's not going to look good on them. These preservatives, you don't have to memorize them, but BHA, BHT, and ethoxyquin, those are the three chemical um, preservatives that are sprayed on the byproducts. You'll see them in older foods like corn, like Kellogg's corn flakes. Sometimes you still see those ingredients. If you see them, I would highly advise not to eat them. All right, so I wanted to get back to this um, meat versus meals because this is a question I get asked probably 90% of the time. Um, on our foods, which I'll get into later, you'll see things like chicken meal, turkey meal. Be like, oh, it's a meal, I don't want that. So all a meal is, is if you think of almond meal, corn meal, it's a dehydrated and crushed form of a food. That's all it is. Almond meal, crushed almonds, corn meal, dried and crushed corn. Um, so when you make a food, you have to dry it and cook it and crush it to make a, to make a dry kibble. So um, meat, when you think about going to the store and you get a pound of raw chicken, it's 75 to 80% water, so it's really heavy. But then when you cook it, all that water cooks out, right? So you're left with you know, 25, 20% of the actual weight, which is a significantly less amount. So what we do is a meal, um, and when we get into ingredient decks, I will show you, but on an ingredient deck of a dry food, they are weighed in order of their raw, wet weight. So if you see just chicken, that was weighed in its 75 to 80% water weight. So of course it's the heaviest ingredient, but then when we cook it down and we only have 20% of that weight left, it's no longer the heaviest ingredient, thus not really the first ingredient in a food. So a meal is, it can be 300 times more concentrated in protein content if you use a meal. And again, that's just a crushed, dehydrated form of a food. That is all it is. So chicken meal versus chicken byproduct meal. Chicken meal would be organ and bone meat. Chicken byproduct meal are those feet, those feet beaks, feathers, carcass, all that fun stuff. Um, and again, sprayed with those three chemical carcinogens. Does anyone have questions on what a meal is? What's a bone meat? A bone meat is the meat connected to the bone. That's all it is. So it's usually richer in things like calcium, phosphorus. All right, so why feed better foods? Pretty much the same as why we eat better, to feel better, to be healthier. So healthier skin and coat, less shedding and dander. The skin is the largest organ in the body, but it's also one of the organs that gets the least attention. You know, your vital organs, your heart, your lungs, your liver, those all get the most attention. And the skin, the largest one, if it doesn't have enough nutrients in the food, it's going to get ignored. Um, so that's when you see a lot of shedding. The hair follicles aren't strong. You see a lot of dander. You know, if you don't shower for a while or you have really dry, itchy skin, you might have a lot of dandruff. Um, and then when you eat really healthy, you might notice that your skin is glowing a little bit more. Same thing with dogs and cats. Nutrient dense, feed less. I say feed less, eat less, poop less. That's my mantra. Um, if they're absorbing more, they're gonna poop less. Um, the poop is going to be easier to pick up, which is better for us. Um, if it's a lot of low quality ingredients, their poop might be a little more runny and you can tell a lot from their, from their stools about how they're absorbing that nutrition. Um, I love the line, many kibbles look the same, but they are very different. Again, that where, when, and how. Cleaner teeth and fresher breath. Dogs and cats don't actually have the enzyme um, in their saliva to break down sugar like we do. So if you think about when you eat sugar, your breath might get a little stinky, but think about dogs and cats who ingest sugar, it's way worse because they can't start breaking it down in their mouth because of that lack of enzyme. So when, you, um, when they ingest a lot of sugar, which in, can come in many forms, think about starch and carbs, they ingest that as sugar. Um, that leads to dental issues and breath issues. A lot of times people will come to me and say, what do you have for my dog's breath? It stinks. And they're wanting me to, to go towards like a dental chew or, or something like that, which I do. However, I want to ask, what are you feeding your dog? Let's look at that sugar content. Better weight management, a more active and playful pet. That's pretty explanatory. 
um, self-explanatory, stronger immune systems for long-term healthier pets. 80% um, of our immune system lives in our gut, just like with us. Um, so a healthy gut means a stronger immune system, means fighting off things like allergies, disease, all of that scary stuff that we don't like to think about. So this is my favorite part. This is what I do for a living. We look at ingredient panels and we basically show exactly what you're feeding your pet because these don't lie. Um, so I, I um, hid what food this is so we can guess after, but um, I'll take you through it. So the, again, ingredient decks are laid out in their um, most ingredient to their, to their least and it's weighed in its raw, wet form. So keep that in mind. So the very first ingredient is whole grain corn. That's one of those corn, wheat, and soy. So when we look at the protein content of this food, a lot of that, most of that, is going to be coming from that corn as it registers as a protein. Meat and bone meal, do we know what animal that's from? No, so that's that. Corn gluten meal, again, corn and gluten, corn, wheat, and soy are those three allergens and fillers registering as a protein. <clears throat> Soybean meal, corn, wheat, and soy, there's that soy. It's a cheap, cheap, cheap filler. Um, animal fat preserved with mixed tocopherols, that's fine, but I'd really like to know what kind of animal that is. Um, and then chicken. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Chicken is the sixth ingredient, but it's also just chicken. So when we actually put that in its dry cooked form, that chicken's going to go even lower on the list because we're taking out that 80% water. So where is the protein coming from? It's coming from corn, some kind of meat and bone of some sort of animal, corn gluten, and soybean. Um, when you're looking at ingredient, in, sorry, ingredient deck, about the first five ingredients tell you the most about the food. Um, is it meat-based? No. Um, good quality meats? I don't know. I don't know what, what kind of meat it is. Um, questionable ingredients, absolutely. Nutrient dense, probably not. If you already eat corn chips your whole life, you might look really good on the outside. You know, feel good, it's a lot of fiber. Um, but are your insides and long-term health going to be on its best track? Probably not. So preservatives, um, I'm seeing mixed tocopherols, which that is a natural preservative. We're okay with that. Um, let's see here. I'm not seeing any sticking out to me, but I will point out the added color, red 40, yellow five, and blue two. That's for the, that marketing, so it looks like there's a lot of veggies in it. Um, so that's what I would go to for that. Yeah. Oh, does anyone wanna take a guess at what, what brand this is? It is the number one purchased brand in America. It is dog chow, Purina dog chow. Number one most purchased brand in America. And if we, I should have brought up a, um, a picture of the front of the bag. If we looked at the front of the bag, I bet you would say it's a chicken based because it has chicken in there. Um, it would probably say no um, um, preservatives, you know, no um, chemical preservatives because of those mixed tocopherols. Um, but we don't know where that meat and bone meal is coming from. We don't know what kind of butcher you know, cut, the, cut that meat so we don't know what kind of preservatives they actually used. Um, so yeah. Do you know why it's the best seller for the market? I'm gonna go with marketing. It's their brand. Yeah, I'm gonna go with um, the money that they have to put into marketing. Um, well, and then also because it costs less. Yeah, oh absolutely, the price point. Yeah, you know, we all have busy lives, we all have our own budgets. Um, and this is what you see at the grocery store, and it's marketed really, really well. Um, and so absolutely. They're gonna say, oh, I can feed my dog for you know, 50 cents a day. Awesome, I'm in. Yeah, you don't have to go to a pet store. Mm -hmm. to go to these exactly, exactly. You do it while you do your grocery shopping. Yeah. And again, um, we scoop, we pour, and we forget. A lot of pet parents aren't taking the time to look at these ingredient mm -hmm. decks because they see it on the, on the shelf, just like their groceries. They're picking it up, putting it in the cart, and it's done. So absolutely, great point. All right, let's look at another one. All right, so we have deboned chicken, potatoes, peas, chicken meal. So that deboned chicken, is that truly the first ingredient? No, because that deboned chicken still has 
Mm -hmm. All of that 75 to 80 percent water weight. It's not a chicken meal. They have to dehydrate it, crush it into a meal to make it into a dry kibble. So that deboned chicken would then go down the list. So let's look at our next ingredient. Potatoes, that's already a dry food. So that's, that's truly where it is. Um, potatoes, white potatoes, are very high glycemic index. Glycemic is basically just the sugar levels that are ingested. Um, and so that's a very starchy, sugary food to start with. Um, and that's the very first ingredient. So we have potatoes and peas as the first two ingredients. Um, those are going to register as a protein. So the protein that you're seeing on the guarantee analysis is going to be coming from a lot of the, um, the potatoes and peas. Um, peas are a great ingredient. I have no issue with that, but I don't want it to be your first ingredient ever. Um, that chicken meal should be the first ingredient. And so another thing that I look at is I'm seeing deboned chicken and then chicken meal, and I'm wondering why they're using two different sources of chicken. That chicken meal is way more concentrated. My guess, and from my experience, is that this deboned chicken is a higher quality chicken, but it's not really, they're not using very much of it, but they get to put it as the first ingredient. So on their bag on the front, I bet you anything, it says chicken is the first ingredient. Um, that chicken meal, because they have to use more of it, I'm guessing is a, is a lower quality chicken. Um, and then look, dried ground potatoes. Um, so two sources of white potato right there, back to that dental issue of bad breath, we're ingesting a lot of sugar. Um, in our in our food so um, yeah but off the bat that's gonna look like a much better ingredient deck than say the dog chow that we just looked at right but when you start asking those questions is it really meat based where is that protein coming from we start to die, um, dissect this and really learn the truth about it um, does anyone want to take a guess at what this is yeah mm-hmm mm-hmm Yep, so just like chicken and chicken meal, potatoes are still going to have some water in it, um, but they're, they're already a dried product. Um, so that dried ground potatoes is actually gonna be more concentrated because it's in its driest form um, on the deck. So those are actually gonna be more concentrated than the second ingredient potatoes. Does that make sense? It's a great question. Um, yeah, any guesses? That's a great guess. Yeah, this is chicken grain-free wellness. And wellness is a very reputable um, known brand, right? Um, but when we start to dissect, it's still a mass production company that is still focused on turning a profit. Um, and it's, it's a chicken, they call it chicken. This one is my favorite to go over. Um, because this is a very, very popular brand. So, um, beef, peas, garbanzo beans, lamb meal. Um, peas, garbanzo beans, I love. They're awesome for dogs. They're great nutrient profiles of vitamins and minerals. Um, they are low glycemic levels, so we're keeping that sugar count down, so awesome. Um, however, when we look at that first ingredient, we're seeing beef. Is beef the first ingredient in this food? That's what you want to think, right? Yeah, right, right. Beef, in its raw, wet form, is the heaviest ingredient in this food. But we have to cook it and crush it into a meal to make it into a dry kibble. So when we take out that 75% water weight, that beef goes down the line. Does that make sense? Awesome. So your first ingredient is peas and garbanzo beans, which are high in protein. A lot of vegetarians use that as their protein source, those beans um, and legumes. But you want your, your meat, I'm sorry, your protein to come from meat for dogs and cats. It's really important. Okay, so how do you get the meat to be your main ingredient? That's a great question. Things like using multiple sources of meat at the front. If that was beef, chicken, lamb, you know, multiple sources, then you're going to have a higher concentration of meat. Or just using a beef meal, because that's that beef, but already crushed before weighed and put into the food. So when you see those meals, as long as they're high quality meals, that is a good thing. You know that it's absolutely the first ingredient and it's highly concentrated in that meat protein. Does that make sense? That's a great question. Um, so lamb meal is our fourth ingredient, but it's our fourth ingredient. You wanna see that in your first and your second ingredients. Um, so I bet you on the front of this bag, it's saying, you know, 
blah, blah, blah with beef or a beef formula, when really it's a lamb formula, which is great, but let's be upfront about that, right? Let's be transparent. Um, oh, you know what? It's going to say with wild boar. Wild boar is the, what, fifth, sixth, seventh ingredient, sixth or seventh ingredient? I know this bag and it says with wild boar, um, but that's also a raw wet weight. So wild boar is a super minimal ingredient in this, but wild boar is exciting and exotic. So that is their marketing. Um, and if you know what brand this is, you know how brilliant their marketing is. Um, the last thing I will point out, two more things, is the ocean fish meal. Fish meal's great, I love that. It means it's concentrated, but what is an ocean fish? No idea. It could be a bottom dweller, it could be a shrimp, a tuna, a salmon. We have no idea. And the reason that a lot of these companies do that is because they may use salmon when it's available and cheap. They might use bottom dwellers when it's available and cheap, but they're not held accountable. They can do what they want, and that helps their profit margins. Um, and the last thing I will point out is the pea flour. Again, I love peas for dogs. They're great vitamins and minerals. Um, however, when you do a flour, those highly, that really brings up the sugar content. Flour, the way that they're processed, is higher sugar content. Um, so that's something that you want to be wary of. You want to keep that glycemic level as low as possible. So peas are a better glycemic index than pea flour. Just the way it's processed, that's all it is. Um, so is it a meat-based food? Where is the protein coming from? Those peas and garbanzo beans, a little bit of lamb, but it's not the first. Um, questionable ingredients? Yeah, that ocean fish meal. It's not sitting well with me. Um, nutrient dense? It's probably gonna seem nutrient dense, um, but after you cook everything out, that nutrient density is going to decrease um, considerably. Preservatives? Um, that's not something that I'm, I'm too worried about just looking at it. Um, that's something that I would have to get um, deeper into to see you know, what they're sourcing and how they're sourcing it. True marketing, that's my favorite question and that's what I urge pet parents to start wondering about. Um, can anyone take a guess at what brand this is? Close, very close. It is Taste of the Wild. It's the, South, the Southwest Canyon formula that says with wild boar. Um, Taste of the Wild has the most brilliant marketing, right? There's a wolf on the bag. Yes, my dog's a wolf, I'm going to feed that food. Yep, exactly like in the wild. It's grain-free, awesome. All Taste of the Wild are grain-free, buzzword. Um, so they do brilliant marketing. I will hand that to them all day. But true marketing, that is where it doesn't sit well. They're not transparent. And they're saying, you know, this is a, a wild boar beef formula when it's really a, a pea and lamb. Plant protein for dogs. Um, I'll use the word bioavailable. Bioavailable is basically your body being able to use the nutrients to fuel. Um, plant protein is very bioavailable bio for humans. It is not bioavailable for dogs. Um, so things like vegetable protein, plant protein for dogs, they need something like 10 times as much plant protein or vegetable protein to get what they would need from meat protein. And so one of the things I preach is prevention. You know, going to the vet is expensive, vet bills are expensive. Um, if we can be preventative, then it's going to be a much lower cost and your, your pet's going to be a lot healthier because we don't have to deal with um, the consequences that come later. Um, and I know that's very dear to Karma Sue's heart, so that's something that we'll talk about. Um, like we said earlier, look for foods that have no preservatives. Mixed decofferols is a natural preservative, so that's okay. Um, but we wanna look for those chemical preservatives that can be um, carcinogenic. BHA, BHC, ethoxyquin. More and more you're not seeing these in food, but going back to the, the animal byproduct, that is where you'll see them without seeing them. Um, the butcher is the one who sprays the chemical preservatives so that the manufacturer doesn't have to put it on their bag. There's a lot of loopholes with that. So it's just something good to kind of know um, that if you see byproduct, think preservatives. It's by law. Um, we don't eat the same thing every day, so why should dogs? Um, humans can walk away from chemicals, but dogs can't, and those build up. Um, 
So we talk about rotational diets. If your dog doesn't have any serious sensitivities or allergies, rotating every about one to three months of that protein is really healthy to just keep their body working in their ideal state. Um, different enzymes break down different foods, so we wanna keep their bodies just as um, optimized as possible. Um, so rot rotational diets um, as much as you can. Um, fresh fruits and veggies, same with humans, antioxidants, fighting free radicals, berries, pumpkins, spinach. Um, I love feeding carrots and peas. Um, sweet potatoes are a great snack too. All of that um, is, is wonderful. Um, water, a lot of times we don't think about, about water. Um, you know, in different states, tap water is, is different. There's different minerals or contents in the water. Um, I know that um, I spoil my dog rotten. We get, um, I call it yum yum water. We get, you know, spring water from El Dorado delivered, and that's what he drinks. And I, I feel really good that I know I'm giving my dog really clean water. Um, so being hydrated is really important, especially for cats. You know, cats don't drink a lot of water. They get it mostly through their food. Um, so making sure your cats and dogs are hydrated is super important. Natural flea and tick, um, parasites are more likely to attack a sick host. So if the immune system's down, it's gonna be a really easy target for those parasites. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're arming with a flea and tick treatment. I personally like to go the holistic route. Um, so Louis doesn't, he doesn't take a flea and tick treatment. I don't necessarily tell anyone to do that, but we have natural, more holistic ways of doing it. So some kind of treatment is really, really important to guard your animal. Um, arm your pet with the best food. Just like us, diet is, is really at the foundation of everything. Um, like I said, the immune system really lives in your gut. Um, so what you put into it, um, I use the hashtag you are what you eat with basically everything because it couldn't be more true. So arm your, your pet with the best food and um, minimize the, the risks. We have a lot of raw feeders who supplement with our kibble um, or vice versa, um, just throwing, you know, like some um, unseasoned cooked, you know, chicken or beef or, or whatnot. And again, you want to pay attention to the quality um, that you're, you're feeding your pet. Um, but absolutely. Yeah, variety is key, you know, freeze dried, raw, dry, wet, canned, I mean, all of those variety is, is key to prevention, 100%. Um, canine cancer, I wanted to talk about this because it's, it's karma sue, it's near and dear to their heart. Um, and it's, it's a really scary thing these days. Instead of dying, you know, after 20 years of old age, roaming around, eating scraps, um, more and more we're seeing our, our fur babies, you know, passing away of, of cancer. Um, and it has a lot to do with the way our society is, is mass producing and sourcing these days and what we're putting into our dog's body. And we don't really know. So that's my goal is to, to help educate and make people more aware. Um, lots of treatment, loss of appetite, not feeling well, bodies are depleted of minerals and nutrients. Um, when this is happening, we want to feed those really high quality proteins. We want to keep it really low carb, low glycemic levels. Um, because their bodies are so depleted, we want to amp up that vitamin and mineral content um, in their bodies to help keep them as strong as possible. Um, a lot of people will pulverize the kibble to make it more into a, like a ground meal, if you will, um, or soften it with like broth or water so it's easier for them to eat. Because a lot of times if they're not feeling well, the crunch is just not going to do it for them. Um, so um, feed canned food wet, make sure they're, they're hydrated, um, just meet the nutritional needs of, of your dog who's not feeling well um, with those, those high quality proteins and low carb content. Um, carnivores, carbs, and cancer. Carnivores assimilate carb load differently than herbivores. So they assimilate the carb load um, different than if you're feeding plant and vegetable proteins, that bioavailability. Um, canines have short digestive tracts and they can't convert carbs to energy quickly enough so it turns to sugar and cancer cells feast on that sugar. So we want to keep it high protein, low carb, low sugar. Um, a 17 year old dog that wanted chemo, I would put those dogs on a high protein grain free diet. We don't want to feed those cancer cells with carbs. Um, 
So if you were on a vegetarian diet, that's a really important time to get that on the high protein meat. Um, keep that carb level low, glycemic level low, and high protein from a source that's most bioavailable for them because they're having trouble with their nutrients already. So we want to keep it you know, on the highest nutrient profile possible for them. Um, some supplements that I wanted to, to touch on. Um, this can obviously dive into a much deeper conversation, but just to, to kind of touch on it. Um, colostrum is the milk of moms. Um, if you think about, you know, forming this baby inside and then them breastfeeding, um, it's the most nutrient-dense, complete, because it's literally made for your baby. Um, so it's filled with antibodies, and it triggers the body's immune system. Um, it is, this is cool, it's the only scientifically proven matter in both Western and Eastern medicine that can kill any single cell virus, bacteria, or fungi. So it's very, very powerful. Um, where to get, you can buy it online, good health food store, farm and feed store, straight bovine, which is cow colostrum. Um, so that's, that's a really, really strong supplement. Um, seaweed, the good kelp, has tons of essential minerals. And when we were talking about um, canine cancer, your body's just deplete. Um, so just kind of flooding the body with all these good vitamins and minerals is, is just going to help that immune system fight. Keep cells from overpopulating. Cancer cells grow so fast and so big, so we want to do everything we can to minimize, minimize that and um, just keep the immune system as, as healthy as possible. There's some mushrooms that are really, really um, have been shown to be anti-tumor and immune system boosters. Um, so we've got, we've, got some, we've got some there. Um, cordyceps, shiitake, and reishi. Um, and one more supplement that I'll throw in there um, is CBD. It's becoming a booming industry. Um, with any booming industry, you also want to pay attention to quality. A lot of quality of CBD out there. But um, human and canine have been using CBD now for cancer. Um, it's been anecdotally shown to, to help kill the cancer cells. Um, obviously, nothing is, is flat out scientifically proven, proven but there's a lot of amazing anecdotal cases of, of canine and human cancer. So I'm a true believer um, in CBD for that, a good full spectrum, high quality CBD. So that's one I'll put in there too. Um, every pet has different needs, which we've kind of touched on throughout the presentation. Um, all around holistic diets, different sizes, ages, life stage foods. Um, there, there are so many different kinds of foods out there today, which is amazing because um, if I've learned anything, every dog and cat is so unique in their needs. You know, not all boxers need the same food, not all German shepherds, not all cats. Like, everything is really case by case. Um, so what works for one dog may not work for the other. Some dogs need grains in their diets. Some dogs need grain-free in their diets. Some dogs need lower fat, even if they're, you know, puppy stage. So um, it's really a case by case. Um, you know, some things like allergies, which we're seeing more and more in, in humans and dogs. Um, we want to keep those limited ingredient diets. We want to boost up that, those immune systems. Um, itchy skin can be a huge one that we see. With the mass production industry just being so um, blasted at high heats and old, um, that skin, the largest organ, is just not getting very much attention. And so the skin just builds upon itself being itchy and dry and hot spots and and all of that. Um, and sensitive stomachs are becoming a bigger thing too, and I think that just goes back to the quality of what we're feeding our animals. Um, so again, just, just a lot of different options out there, and um, if there's any takeaway from that, it's just that every dog is unique. You know, AFCO guidelines might say that, you know, the average adult dog needs, needs this um, and needs to be fed this amount, and I'll have pet parents saying, well, I'm feeding, you know, a full cup less than that, you know, what's going on. And you know, every, every body is different. So it's just what your animal needs. And a lot of times it's trial and error to find, you know, the best fit for your dog. Um, and so I wanted to, to take a minute and kind of introduce what I do. Um, so I am the owner of Pet Once Denver. Um, we are a fresh pet food company here in Denver. Um, the where, when, and how. So we source all of our ingredients from the U.S. except for things like lamb is New Zealand, salmon is Nova Scotia, all our chicken is U.S. Um, varying from season, season to on the different farms. Um, 
when we source our ingredients fresh monthly. That's why we ran out of lamb for the global lamb shortage. We couldn't produce lamb for several months. We source our ingredients fresh, so they're never sitting. And then we make our food fresh every single month. Um, so it's made and it goes within the weeks of the month versus the months and the years that it sits in um, distribution and retail. Um, so that's probably a quick thing to go over is, is the way commercial mass-produced pet food works is it's made and then it goes and sits in um, distribution, manufacturing distribution. It can sit there for up to six months depending um, to see where it's going to go. And then it gets distributed and it sits in distribution warehouses, you know, to, for all the logistics of, of where it's gonna go around the, the country or the world. Um, and then it goes and sits in retail. And it can sit either in a retail warehouse or on the shelf. Um, eventually it'll make its way to the shelf. So by the time it gets to your store shelf, again, it's already been blasted at really high temperatures, but then it hits your store shelf um, and it's been sitting anywhere from six months to two years. So a lot of times if you're buying the food, it can be close to um, expiring by the time that you're feeding it. Something kind of to, to keep in the back of your, of your mind with that where, when, and how. Um, so, so yeah, we make our food fresh every month. So um, we cook it, we slow cook the food at temperatures about 180 degrees. So it's really working on cooking those nutrients in versus blasting them out. So we slow cook them in small batches for quality control and then we get it to your pet within the month. Um, so it's a lot higher nutrient density. Um, it is always meat first, always. We use meat meals, very high quality meat meals so that that concentration is high. Um, and um, yeah, we, we cater to all different animals. We have grain-free options. Everything is gluten, soy, and corn-free. But like I said, some animals need grains, some needs grain-free, so we have both options. Life stage puppy and senior. Um, and then all of our limited ingredient adult formulas with our um, whole grain brown rice. So all of our formulas are by the pound. That way we can cater to your specific um, pet's needs. If you need a little bit low fat, but you want some salmon, you know you can mix and match by the pound to create a formula that works best for your animal. Because again, everything's case by case. Um, so yeah, you guys got to meet Louie in person, but here's our adoption picture. We adopted him at 10 weeks, um, our fat little Louie potato. So um, thank you guys for, for listening and, and hopefully learning some things to be more mindful of when you do pick out your pet food. And um, we are predominantly um, an education pet nutrition company. So even if you're not using pet ones, we're all, always available to help you know, keep your, your cat or dog as healthy as possible. So if you have any questions, feel free. Um, otherwise, thank you so much. <laughs>